Hi. Like most people, we were stunned with the events of January 6, 2021, the breach of the United States Capitol. In light of these events, DMLA wants to celebrate the courageous work of photojournalists and filmmakers who risked their lives to bring us the story. In October 2020, we heard from renowned photojournalists at DMLA's Digital Media Licensing Conference about the personal risks they take every day. These working photojournalists have covered the pandemic, protests, and many other major events during the last year. We hope you enjoy seeing some of their work and hearing about their experiences. Good day and welcome to Tales from the Trenches, true stories from working photojournalists. My name is Jonathan Wells and I manage SEPA USA, a news photo agency based in New York. We've been covering news, sports, entertainment and other subjects for more than 30 years. I'm an active member of the DLMA and this year serve on the program committee for this conference. It's been an honor and a privilege to make this presentation. Needless to say, 2020 has been one of the most tumultuous years in recent history. From the global uh, pandemic we're facing right now to Black Lives Matters protests, photojournalists have been challenged like never before and forced to adapt to new conditions and challenges on a nearly daily basis. We have four award-winning photographers with us today who will share their work and experiences from the streets of New York inside the White House, from hospitals and, and looting, protests, rallies, and to Rose Garden press conferences, major sporting events without fans, this year has seen it all. We even had an impeachment process. I've asked each panelist to share a selection of their work. After that, we'll have some time for discussion. In the meantime, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A function here in Zoom. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panelist. Tony Behar has been a staff photographer for CPUSA since 2011. He covers news, sports, entertainment, business. Tony covers it all. Before CEPA, Tony was a contributing photographer with Getty Images and a picture editor and digital retoucher with contour images, contour photos. Tony has a BA in journalism and mass communication from New Mexico State University. He speaks five languages, English, French, Spanish, Italian, and Indonesian. So with that, Tony, I'd like to turn it over to you and look forward to your presentation. Tony. Hi, everybody. Hi, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, well, I'm actually very honored to be here, uh, mostly because I'm sharing the uh, stage with uh, a couple of people that I really admire uh, and uh, call friends, really good friends, and it's really nice to work with them. Um, I'm going to give you a slideshow of uh, some of the images that I've been taking over the last couple of months, starting with uh, the ones we did in New Year and then hopefully rolling up to uh, very recent uh, imagery. Um, let me start by saying that uh, uh, I'm a Nikon shooter, so I shoot, so you all, all the pictures you see will be done with, Ni with Nikons. Uh, God bless the mirrorless, I love those little cameras. And uh, one of the things that I want to start off saying right away is that um, uh, throughout the last couple of months, uh, try to stay as safe as possible, really. I, I, I can't stress enough, so it's double masks. Um, everything is uh, sanitized, uh, you know, before you leave the apartment, when you get into the car, when you get out of the car, masks take the picture you need to do, come back, disinfect the cameras with alcohol, get into the car, come back home, get undressed outside the door, <laughs> and then um, and then come in, shower, and then uh, go ahead and process the picture. So it's really been uh, a very, um, it, it's tedious just to just try to stay uh, clean and try to stay safe. Let me start the slideshow. Here we go. So, uh, um, you know, the year started off uh, just with, you know, regular, uh, regular entertainment, like I was saying. 
Uh, and everything that we did up until uh, I think late February was really all about access. It's all about uh, the agencies getting their uh, uh, getting access to the events and making sure that we have a spot, make sure we can get in, take the pictures that we need to take. Um, so here's a professional bull riding. Moved into a uh, day without uh, pants on the subway. Uh, a fun event, uh, a little strange, and news coverage. Uh, you know, I think the, the Weinstein trial, the Me Too movement uh, was very, very important. That's why I included it. Uh, a little bit of uh, Bloomberg coming into the race a little late. Uh, went to head and covered the, uh, the, uh, the dog show, the, uh, the Westminster dog show, which is a lot of fun. And uh, then uh, I flew out to Miami with my team went to cover the Super Bowl. Again, it's all about the access, getting everything in order, uh, getting your passes, and uh, getting on the field and taking pictures, uh, uh, J-Lo, Shakira, um, a little bit of the game. And uh, came back to New York, settled for a day or two, and then jumped back on a plane and went out to California. And this is that I think even in, in uh, out in Miami where we were for the Super Bowl. We started hearing, you know, COVID, COVID, COVID. But we weren't we weren't quite settled into it yet. So we just everything was normal. Uh dog show winner. Tony, can you just refresh uh yeah. our me. audience on the date we were at the um the Oscars, end of February? Let me see. So specifically for the Oscars. Uh, so the Oscar red carpet was uh, February 9th. Okay, yeah, thank you. February 9th. So we, like I said, we'd, we'd heard about it. Well, I think when we heard about it, Jonathan, when did we start hearing about this COVID more? I think it was more, yeah, I think it about was. About that time. Well, about that time. Let me go back to my slideshow. I'm sorry about that, guys. I really am. Sorry, I think I got out of it by accident. Oops. Sorry, 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 sorry. Apologize. So February, early February, we're in LA after the Super Bowl, and then um, and then that things started being becoming more pronounced. Uh, I was sent out uh, late February to go take pictures of uh, people in masks. Um, uh, there was starting to get a fear of uh, that this was coming in from from Asia, from China, in particular. And, uh, that there was a, a, a sort of, you know, what, was it going to come to America? Was it going to come here? Was it going to, when was the first case going to show up? So we went out and illustrated the mask situation. Although I have to admit that living near, near, uh, near Flushing, living in a Chinese uh, uh, neighborhood, people wear masks anyway. So uh, we did the uh, international uh, uh, toy fair. Uh, that's, of course, I wanted to give everybody a chance to see what it looked like when I'm working hard. Um, Kept on doing a couple of events, uh, entertainment events. And uh, as it became more apparent that this was not going to go away, uh, news became more and more serious. And uh, the first, I think this was on, let me see, when was this? Sorry, no, it's in, sorry for all the uh, delay. Yeah, March 2nd, it got serious. Uh, uh, de Blasio held a meeting. Uh, and it's funny because nobody's got, nobody has masks. We weren't wearing masks yet. This was the powwow, this is the big powwow of how we're going to deal with the, the COVID situation in New York City. Uh, Bloomberg uh, bowing out, uh, Me, Too, Me Too movement, uh, the uh, sentencing of Harvey Weinstein. And again, we're not, we're, we're not wearing masks. We're out there, we're, we're, we're shoulder to shoulder. Uh, we know that it's coming, but people are not, uh, the alarm hasn't been sounded. So, Tony, do you remember the date on this, on the uh, Weinstein sentencing? Weinstein sentencing was, and I apologize for keeping you. I think it was uh, mid-March by now already? Uh, March 11th. Yeah. March 11th. Yeah. So it's really uh, a week before yeah. the city shut down. Yeah. Uh, March 12th, uh, uh, you know, we'd heard about uh, New Rochelle. So go out to New Rochelle. I know that it was the um, uh, the Army Reserve uh, that started moving food and helping people. We couldn't get to uh, couldn't get to stores and everything. And the city was shut down, as you can see. 
And here we were, I mean, you know, first group of photographers out there, you know, wearing masks, gloves, and we weren't sure what, what we, we didn't know how to handle it. I mean, we, we really didn't know, we didn't know how to be around each other. And I remember when I came back from, uh, from New Rochelle, I went to go have lunch uh, without a mask with a friend and I was sitting in a cafe and a woman, you know, overheard my conversation. She said, you know, you just came back from New Rochelle. You shouldn't even be in the store. You shouldn't even be sitting and eating any food in this establishment. You should leave right away. So I think this is the very last entertainment uh, gig that we did. It was, um, it was uh, God's Love. Uh, love rocks. God loves. Uh, God love, loves rock. Uh, uh, charity for for raising uh, money for food, and um, people started wearing masks, and so masks became ubiquitous. So uh, we'd go around the city. City was shut down. Everybody remembers that part. Uh, very empty. And uh, we started getting uh, alerts that uh, there was going to be testing sites. So this is just the, for one of the first testing sites in um, Staten Island. Uh, it was interesting how people were communicating with, uh, with signs, written pieces of paper, uh, Army Reserve, or National Guard, I should say, people coming by. And New York City, people started, started getting serious. Uh, things, a lot of things were shut down. Uh, if you wanted food service, you, you know, I don't know, drive in, of course. And I live uh, in Elmers, which was dubbed the uh, epicenter of the epicenter, so to speak. So this is the Elmers Hospital where people were starting to get COVID uh, testing uh, early on. Tony, and, how were you received uh, at like the testing center or uh, you, uh, Elmers Hospital? Uh, well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think that photographing I think I think the transition from I mean, for me particularly uh, being a red carpet photographer, you are an entertainment photographer. You kind of have some control over it. I mean, you know, you're asking for people's attention when you're on the red carpet and you're screaming at them. You're trying to get their attention. You're talking to them. You're making funny remarks, and so you want them to react to you while you're taking a picture. And so now you're out in the streets, and now you're taking pictures of people who are potentially sick. And so you have a whole new set of rules. Um, I know that there, I think it was called the, the, the HIPAA, HIPAA law. Mm -hmm. uh, for privacy. So, yeah, for privacy. So it was early on, no full faces, no documents, no nothing. You know, you couldn't, I didn't want to photograph the test kits or anything. Well, you couldn't because they went into tents, test, into tents here. But uh, I got a lot, early on, I got a lot of, um, uh, you could see the people that were sick, they wouldn't react, but the other people would just give you kind of not dirty looks, but they would kind of look past you and nothing was ever said. Nothing was ever said, not yet. We'd keep go, we'd keep go out, out every, every day and just shoot and see if we could get, you know, a good picture about what was happening. Uh, Cuomo was setting up uh, the tents inside uh, the Javits Center. Uh, and this is what we look like. Now we were, now we're in, I think, you know, a good a good way into let me see i'm give you a specific date um now we were in march yeah we were in march and um end of march and now we were wearing masks wearing gloves but we still didn't know it's kind of kind of weird uh, i'd go out every day on the streets and try and look for something uh there was food hoarding uh there was toilet paper hoarding um you know uh and that was becoming normal and uh, it was getting a little weird. Uh, the USS Comfort came in. We were all down there for that. So this is uh, Battery Park, of course, when it comes to the Statue of Liberty. And this is out in uh, Weehawken, New Jersey, the Manhattan skyline. And uh, Samaritan tents, uh, was it Samaritan set up a, a COVID specific um, hospital tent uh, next to Mount Sinai. In Central Park. In Central Park, uh, on the Upper West, on the Upper East Side. Here you have two birds maintaining social distance uh, and people coming in. So one of the one of the particular things that we had to be careful was how are we going to caption this? I mean, how can you can you tell that a person is, can you say that a person is, is COVID, uh, is infected with COVID or is COVID positive? Um, when they're being wheeled into a place that is specifically for a COVID treatment? 
well, I tried to stay away from, from unless I knew that the person was infected, I, and I could confirm it, I would just say that a patient was coming in. And that's another thing about, about transition from, uh, from uh, entertainment uh, to photojournalism is your, uh, you know, your captions. You have, to be, you have to be very precise about what you're going to say about what's in the picture. Uh, this is uh, uh, because, uh, sorry, Tony. So yeah. because uh, if somebody, if you were at NYU Hospital, for mm -hmm. example, or even mm -hmm. Elmer's for that matter, mm -hmm. someone was walking in the hospital uh, at that time, it's possible mm -hmm. that they were there for COVID treatment, but yeah. it's not right. But they could be there for something else. Right. So we exactly. have to be very careful about very, very careful. I have to be very careful what I said. Very generic. Um, this is one of the first times where uh, uh, I photographed um, the uh, COVID victims being brought out of a hospital and be put into a refrigerator truck um, specifically. And this is, has to be one of those moments where you're, you know, your, 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 your heart is in your throat and, and you, you're so scared and, and it's, 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 I, I don't know. It's just, it's very sad. It's a very, very sad. It's a very difficult picture to take. I mean, you, you're on adrenaline. You, you want to get the shot, but it's still a very difficult picture to take. Um, uh, a hearse, someone from a uh, morgue is going to pick up the body, getting ready. Uh, the the tents, the body processing tents uh, outside of uh, uh, Bellevue. Uh, this is um, uh, Easter Mass. Uh, I think we were all, there were very, 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 very few people were there. Uh, it wasn't open yet. The churches and the synagogues and houses of worship were still closed. And so what I wanted to say is uh, throughout this, through this presentation, I have, I have two or three three or four moments that were really uh, pivotal for me. And this, this image, even though it's quite benign, it's a man crossing the street in empty, empty, the empty uh, uh, Pine Grand Central Terminal. This man turned around to me and uh, threatened to hurt me and he ran after me and he, and, and so the moment for me of going from, you know, being a photojournalist to uh, suddenly being uh, attacked for being a photojournalist um, I'm not sure if it's the way that I came off when I thanked him. I did, I did say thank you for the picture. I mean, uh, after he had passed, but you're not, you're never really ready for people to come at you and, and threaten to hurt you and, and insult you. Uh, so this was, this was the first time that it had happened, uh, seriously enough. Manhattan, uh, you know, honoring of, uh, first responders in front of the hospital, in front of Elmer's hospital here. And then I had, a, a another sort of aha moment, I shouldn't call it that, but that's what it's gonna be. Uh, food insecurity, and I think that the food insecurity, uh, which is really a big problem now, uh, continues to be a big problem, it was really something, uh, if, if taking pictures of people who are uh, dead is not uncomfortable enough, then taking pictures of people who are hungry is not any better, and it's it's difficult. You walk through the street and you, 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 you kind of, you don't really engage with them, but you sort of, you know, I, I would make myself known. You could see that I, I was there. You could see that I had a camera and you could see my press pass. And uh, some people would say, no, please don't take a picture of me. They'd wave me off and I'd comply, no problem. Other people would just stay there and let be, let themselves be photographed. Uh, Grand Central Terminal, empty. Uh, this is the first time I got into a COVID testing center. Uh, we were allowed into the center before people were being tested, but not uh, during the test. Uh, and this is a, and the reason I bring that up uh, without the testing is that the big thing with the transition from entertainment to photojournalism, so to speak, is the fact that now you're out there. I have a great team behind me uh, and they're extremely helpful in helping me organize what my day is going to be, what the things need to be covered and everything. Um, and we do our best to try and contact the people that we need to contact in order to get access, such as um, uh, the, the Thunderbirds fly over Manhattan. And I thought it was funny because Trump uh, tweeted my picture. Um, but now you're sort of left uh, to what we call, or what I call, I think it was a term dubbed by a Craig Ruddle, uh, you're enterprising. So you're going out there, you're getting the information that you need to, 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 to get, and then you're, you're going out there and you're looking for the picture. You're actively talking to people and, and working with people to get, to get a photograph. USS Comfort leaving, 
uh, uh, I mean, I don't I think they had like 80 patients or something that they left. And uh, as I was photograph, as I was going around photographing, I noticed these uh, these uh, not doormen, but they're kind of like you know these sentinels that were behind these these closed shops, and so they would just stand there and they were just security and they had nothing to do. And I, I kind of like that solitude. Uh, more press coverage of the of the of the governor. Uh, you know, he wanted to push the, you know, how clean the subways would be because he wanted to bring people back into the subway. Um, you know, people wearing masks, more cleaning. Um, and so here you have 2 a.m. in the Bronx uh, getting onto trains uh, to photograph people cleaning. Uh, a little 2 a.m. in the morning, I mean, driving all the way up to the Bronx was fun. Uh, I like this photograph a lot because I think it's sort of, you know, uh, give me liberty or give me death kind of thing. Um, and then a, a good friend of mine happened to be driving by and took a picture of me. Tony, those were refrigerated trucks for yeah, so, yes. bodies, right? Yes, yes, yes. So this is where they store, this is actually uh, where they store the refrigerated trucks. Um, but I did see a hearse come in. So there, uh, there was tight security. So I believe that there were bodies in there. Uh, this was in Brooklyn. That's me getting up there and taking a picture. Again, more driving around, more looking for pictures. Uh, trying to illustrate, and then uh, and then in a, I talk to a lot of the photographers. Like I said, I'm really grateful to be working with fantastic people. You're going to meet three of them after I speak, um, and so I was connected with uh, a photojournalist who allowed me uh, to talk to a funeral home uh, about uh, taking pictures of them uh, getting ready to move the bodies for cremation, the COVID COVID victims. And when we got there, I got there early, and this happens to be the funeral director who was burying his father who had died of COVID. And one of the things that I had learned is that his father had died, um, I think, 10 days prior, almost two weeks earlier. And he was so busy embalming uh, bodies, um, so busy with the overflow of, of victims that he couldn't even take the time to bury his father. So he finally got found one morning to do it. And we attended the funeral. We were given incredible access. Uh, heart wrenching, absolutely heart wrenching to to watch somebody uh, be buried. Very, very, very sad. Then we went back to the funeral home, and uh, just this very strange picture came by. And was, he's junk man, uh, you know, pushing a cart past the funeral home. And we waited into the went into the funeral home and started taking pictures of the caskets. One thing that I was asked to do um, out of respect for the family and by uh, by request of the funeral home was to blur any any numbers or any names or any information on the caskets and that was put in the caption. Um, uh, the funeral director, one of the funeral directors, one of three uh, pushing a body out, uh, bringing it into a U-Haul van of all places, uh, loading, loading the U-Haul van up uh, with, with uh, bodies. And so they're not in caskets, they're in these uh, boxes and then they're being, uh, they're going to be driven up to a Syracuse for cremation. Well, I like that juxtaposition as they're loading the bodies. A woman walk, goes by with the, the groceries. Uh, on the lighter side, uh, Sarah Silverman uh, doing her 7 p.m. tribute to heroes. We were asked to photograph that. Um, police helping people out. A man had fallen in the street. And I kind of wanted to document. Um, I know there's a lot of backlash against uh, the NYPD and against uh, the police. And, you know, it is what it is, so to speak. Um, but I really wanted to find some moments where uh, these men and women uh, did good things. I mean, they did. They really did. Um, more more workers. Um, this is an interesting. I went to, like I said, I was really touched uh, by this uh, food insecurity. And uh, right across the street from the funeral home is a beautiful church, St. Bartholomew Church. And they gave me access to photograph uh, them uh, giving, handing food out. And while I was there, the, this, you know, people started praying. And there was this sort of spontaneous uh, religious moment. And it, it was incredible to see these people uh, pray like this out in the street, open, you know, on their knees. And uh, very touching. Very, very, very touching. Uh, more de Blasio, de Blasio yelling at somebody uh, to put a mask on um, uh, down to Domino Park, of uh, police handing out. Um, we kept on, uh, kept on, uh, you know, went down to Wall Street when I needed to go to Wall Street to report on the stock market doing 
uh, went out to Coney Island, uh, Coney Island Beach to photograph the uh, people on the beach. Beaches were not open. They weren't going to be open for a while. People still stuck on and spent their day there. More street photography, trying to cover the COVID uh, uh, situation and uh, more, uh, more food insecurity. And so this is about the time uh, that the riot, I don't want to say riots, I don't want to say looting, but uh, sort of some more social unrest that uh, caused a lot of damage to, to many stores throughout the city. So I happened to take a picture of this car and then uh, a couple of days later, it was burned to the ground and looting. Hey, hey, Tony. Yes, sir. I think pretty much we're going to probably yep. wrap it up. Okay. There. Um, All right. And then we'll. All right. All right. I, I apologize to my other friends and colleagues uh, for taking no their time. No apology is necessary, um, Tony. We, I, we thank you for your presentation. All right. I'm sorry about that, guys. Uh, a lot more to show you, but I'll do it another time. And let's see here. We are going to. Um, introduce our next panelist, uh, Angela Weiss. Angela moved uh, in early 2000 from Berlin to Berlin, Germany, to Las Vegas, where she studied uh, photography and started um, photographing entertainment subjects. Uh, she worked with some musicians like Madonna, photographing on tour, and then was hired by Cirque du Soleil, which I find pretty interesting. Sadly, Cirque du Soleil uh, closed, I believe, this year due to COVID. Uh, she was photographing the opening of the new, uh, at the time, uh, Beatles Love Show. She then moved to uh, Los Angeles to work as a freelancer a photographer at Getty and AFP. And since 2016, uh, she has been a staff photographer for AFP in New York, the French news agency. So with that, I will turn it over to Angela. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, DMLA, for having me. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm an entertainment photographer. My background is red carpets, concerts. So this year was very loud to say the least. It was up and down and be jumping into news was a very, very different and new field. Um, I would like to take you on a little journey from February to now. Excuse me, Angela, just one uh, interruption. Yeah. Uh, behind Angela, you'll see all her press passes from various events. Um, probably what's, uh, and why is that important? Probably because this year after maybe March 15th or so, you probably didn't have a single press pass, a press pass for an event. It was all on the street, much different than what you norm are, are normally used to, right? It was all about- All, all we need to have is an NYPD right. pass, um, press right. pass to, you know, be allowed behind barricades or right. whatnot. And Right. That's it. Um, I will start sharing my screen. So for me, the biggest event that I flew out in the last four years since I've been a staff photographer with AFP um, was the Super Bowl in Miami, similar to Tony. Um, I was mainly hired to photograph the halftime show, got a little glimpse of the game as well. Um, tons of people, lots of excitement. Then I came back and got into Fashion Week immediately. Um, with Fashion Week, we have to get credentialed for all the shows. You have to have, uh, you know, you either denied or accepted. Um, and yeah, you get backstage access, access to runways. So I take care of the credentialing process as well as like photographing some of the shows and hiring some of the freelancers that work with us. Um, these are some of the photos from the shows. And then this was perhaps the last concert I photographed. It was the Today Show. Um, and that was at the end of February. So that was about two weeks before the lockdown covered the Harvey Weinstein trial. For me, that was a little new because we had to show up at five, six in the morning, put ladders down, wait around, wait for him to arrive, enter the building. And then word got around that there was a female bathroom on the 15th floor of the court building where you could actually see down and get an overhead shot of Harvey that you know only one other person got before. 
So some of the girls got together, went into that female bathroom, and this is actually how it looked like. This is the New York Times photographer leaning out to get this shot. Probably want to have your neck strap on uh, for that one. Yep, Angela. absolutely. <laughs> we were shaking and it was freezing cold and <laughs> it's definitely not easy to, to get this. But this is kind of like, you know, the scenario, sometimes you're looking at a photo and you think it's just a picture, but there's a lot of story behind it. Um, and then this is the first assignment where my editor called and said, could you go to Broadway? This is entertainment related. They closed all the shows down. And, you know, I call this kind of the lights went out on Broadway and I realized that perhaps this is like, this is entertainment is gonna be down for a while. Although we didn't know if the Met Gala would happen or not, but this is, you know, this is all of, all of a sudden the kind of daily routine. You pack your backpack. I went on my bike because I didn't take the subway. I didn't feel safe in a taxi or Uber. I would just go around um this time square friend central uh, empty oddly, freeways this was yeah. oddly uh angela it, it was easy for photographers to get around the city uh unfortunately because there was just nobody around the traffic was uh, someone described it it was traffic like sunday morning in august uh you know at 7 a.m yeah. <laughs> right and but yeah it was, i mean it was tuesday in march <laughs> Any given time, once I had a rental car, I was good to go. Any given time, you could go from Brooklyn to Times Square in no time, you know, and just speed through the city pretty much. This yeah. is 42nd Avenue, uh, 42nd Street, rather, uh, Grand Central. It had, in a sense, an eerie feel of, you know, you did see some people out and, you know, the hoarding began of toilet paper buying and people stocking up, empty shelves, panic, where's the carbs? There was no more bread or flour or, uh, you know, pasta to get. Um, and then people started lining outside to get COVID tested and there was incredibly long lines. Um, staff checking the lines to see how many people are, you know, each hospital, people feeling ill. I wasn't quite sure, you know, how close should you be with people? We were wearing N95 masks, of course, and like usually used long lenses in order to, to cover these um, uh, people. Also to be a little bit away and give them some privacy, although it felt uneasy often to, to be, you know, in people's private lives and interrupting when they're feeling sick or, or concerned. Yeah, then all of a sudden, all over town, bodies needed to be stored. So Tony mentioned it before, there were refrigeration trucks set up outside hospitals in the back alleys of places. And often it was difficult to even get these photos because it was all closed off or you couldn't really get, you know, close enough to it. Um, this is actually a patient getting antibody tested. Um, two of my colleagues got uh, very ill at the very beginning in March. So I was the only photographer on staff at that time. So for me coming from entertainment was a big um, uh, transition. And we hired a freelancer to help out with, with a lot of the work, which was great. Um, so it was two of us covering the city at that time. Um, there was tents set up for overflow of patients outside hospitals, um, the National Guard coming in. And then um, this is a screen where they were trying to hide the bodies that came out of the hospital. There was all of a sudden a little more media, press gathered, um, bodies being loaded in out of the trucks into, you know, uh, hearse. And I think Angela, the more... Sorry, I'm going to oh, keep ahead. the questions till the to the end so we can get through the uh, 
that's and no I think the more you know the more it got known the the, the higher the rate of of death when the more people thank the healthcare workers and people were working you know 20 hours and sleeping four hours and being out there and you know and it was it was quite emotional at 7 p.m the clapping and the music and healthcare workers coming out and and other essential staff and workers fire trucks um a lot of thank you notes on buildings on hospitals and and I wanted to get into a little bit of the economy, like stores started closing, you know, if there was for rent signs that popped up, food lines, people, you know, just trying to get something. Um, and with that, my routine ch uh, changed as well. Like I came home every day and stripped down in the hallway and put my clothes in a hamper, sanitized my gear, went into the shower, filed my photos, and you know, also to keep my own family safe and um, not bring any COVID home. The, the death of um, George Floyd, which was May 25th, you know, started this whole Black Lives Matter, didn't start the movement, but rather continued it. And it was just, from smaller protests to all of a sudden it just became bigger and bigger and more photographers at that point came out as well. Very tense, uh, Angela, right? Very tense time in New York. Very tense, very, you know, something that I haven't covered before when police start spraying mace or tear gas and, and you know, you need to be equipped for it. And at, these, at this very night, like I wasn't, I did not have a helmet. I did not have any goggles on or anything like that. And you get pushed around and, you know, some one photographer got arrested by the police, although he had a police press credential and he was fighting it. And he said, I'm, I'm legit, I'm, you know, and they still arrested him and kept him in prison overnight. This was probably the biggest protest I did. And then you had random moments where a protester would just stand on the Brooklyn Bridge and shut down the bridge. I mean, they couldn't let any traffic through, so they would shut down the bridge. And um, this is from a Black Lives Matter mural that was painted in front of Trump Tower. I went back the next morning and got this overhead shot um, from a gallery. And then I got sent to uh, Pennsylvania. So things switched for me a little bit um, to, there was the first debate night and we got access to a small Trump viewing party of Trump supporters. And that was very different to, you know, his perspective on things and, um, you know, to get that kind of access and have them trust media you know because we are a news agency and everybody's very skeptical um do we do the right reporting and are we biased you know <laughs> these little bubble tents popped up in in new york and people getting creative with now uh it being cold out and still be safe and so this just last week, I got sent onto the Biden campaign trail um, with seven other uh, pool photographers. So it was called the Travel Pool. And this is the very first time and very exciting for me to be driving with the motorcade of Biden, you know, flying in, in planes and, and covering whatever he's doing. So I just got back. Um, Yesterday. yesterday afternoon. <laughs> yesterday afternoon. Yeah, I'm like already turned around. Um, so yesterday afternoon. Um, and again, and so in this time, it's like, it's very different than like the Black Lives Matter, where you can just be on the street and and shoot and cover, you know, be free in a sense, versus now very strict credentialing. Like there's only a very small pool allowed to photograph him on his travels, and so that was that was 
going back to now, okay, things being a little more civilized. <laughs> Except to Angela, um, with with Angela, with uh, the freedom though in New York during the summer, uh, came some risk, right? Because you really didn't. You had to like really have eyes in the back of your head. Uh, if you're right in the middle of a protest, you didn't really know who's behind you. Um, you had to be yeah. right. I mean, you could do what you wanted, but there was there was still some risk, right? Some uncertainty. For me, for me, a big challenge was, for example, like also filing your photos, sending your photos, editing, because normally you can be in a Starbucks or in a coffee shop or you know go somewhere on a bench and, right. and just edit your photos away but now you're like feeling okay uh having your gear out having your laptop and people might want to you know steal or are interested in what it is you know and and there's also no bathrooms so right. yeah <laughs> it's it was it was tough to be out there and like not being able to use the bathroom anywhere or trying to find somewhere a spot in like a park or you know it's it's it wasn't um it wasn't easy so this was uh we arrived at a um at a drive-in event for biden two days ago and trump supporters had blocked off um part of the street so this is the motorcade and that's it Thank you, Angela. That was great. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, great. We will uh, move on to our third photographer, Johnny Angelillo, um, who's here in New York. Johnny has been a staff photographer for UPI since 1997. He specialized mainly in sports and entertainment, um, which uh, ironically are two areas that were hit particularly hard by the pandemic, with live sports and live entertainment. He also runs his own corporate photography business for the past 20 years. And Johnny uh, holds a BA in music studying classical piano and music theory. He's also an avid golfer and um, played around at the world famous Augusta National Course. So <laughs> with that, I'll turn thanks. it over to Johnny. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks very much. Uh, I just want to say, uh, just for the record, I, I'm only full time seven years. I've been freelancing for UPI for over 20 years. so. Let me just get right into it, if that's all right. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so just like Tony and Angela said, it was big events at the beginning of the year with no thoughts of anything, you know, COVID related or. Uh, let's see if we can get this wrong here. Uh, we went to the Oscars after the Super Bowl. to come by but uh i remember even this particular photo waiting maybe 15 minutes outside of the new york stock exchange just to get somebody wearing a mask it really didn't didn't take off in february there's a premiere from february i believe or maybe even early march where they're bumping elbows and you know not even taking it seriously uh uh the, the stock exchange was where you really got a feeling that something serious was about to happen or happening uh the market was um um you know, doing poorly, uh, really, uh, it was falling by, uh, the Dow was falling thousands of points every day. They were stopping trading uh, on occasion. And that's where we, you know, in, in my opinion, where you really felt that something bad was happening. Uh, this was the final day of the closing bell and uh, they were shutting it down. I remember one of the traders saying that, uh, you know, we'll be back in two weeks or three weeks. And, you know, that was seven months ago. I, I think the, the at the beginning of COVID, we started shooting, you know, empty landmarks. That was a big part of it for me anyhow, because really I had, I had no assignments. I, I had to go out and kind of find everything on my own. So whatever you could do to just, you know, make a picture outside, you started a shift and you, you know, that was really the only photos available other than mayor and governor press conferences, uh, you know, going to landmarks, just showing the city where you, uh, in a way that it may never be seen again. It was beyond, you know, a Sunday, as you said, in August. It was beyond a, uh, a holiday weekend. It, it, the city was just completely closed and, and almost like one of the movies uh, that you would see where the whole population of the world has been annihilated. Um, sorry, this photo here was when that comfort ship arrived. Uh, all of us covered that. That was looking forward to an event to cover. He actually had something to show up to that day. This was a pop-up hospital in Central Park, a very empty Central Park. I don't think you'll ever see the West Side Highway as quiet as it is right here. And this was a rush hour on a weekday. You, you just can't cross that street. 
I didn't set out to do a feature on how it affected animal owners or pet owners, but I did stumble on this lady forced to say goodbye. Uh, they were going to put, she was going to put her dog down outside of the humane society. And she was saying her last goodbyes on the street. They just would not let her go inside, uh, you know, to share that moment with uh, probably a pet she had for, you know, I, I don't really remember exactly, but it could be a dozen years. She made a last plea to go inside to say goodbye. Uh, they just would not let her in. And, and, and then she just kind of walked away without her dog, you know, for the last time. Um, you, know, you know, again, more landmarks. I, I can't say I enjoyed doing landmarks that were empty, but certainly I, I knew that, you know, you may not see this ever again. We had Easter Sunday mass that was only available through live stream and a couple of photographers were lucky enough to go in and cover that. Uh, more landmarks here, um, rubber gloves. This was Sixth Avenue, Times Square. Uh, I, I spent a big bulk of my day capturing those, uh, you know, those important locations. I, I think there was a 10 day period where every day or every other day there was a flyover from somebody, JetBlue or, or whatever it was. Um, it, it was, it was had planned for the day and in a day like, uh, like Angela and Tony, we always know what we're doing. Well, we have this premiere, we have that premiere. This was the days where you didn't know where you were going at nine in the morning. You didn't know how your day was going to happen. I refused to give up on the fact that I wasn't having a Met Gala. Literally, it's my favorite event to shoot. And I, I was so, you know, I was so, it meant so much to me that I just, I showed up there with a flash on the night that the actual event was supposed to take place because I just couldn't get it out of my head that, that this was not going to happen this year. Uh, you know, again, it, it just, it was a very uncomfortable spot to be in if you shoot entertainment and sports. Um, Johnny, for those who don't know, the Met Gala is the, it's the Oscars of uh, New York, right? I mean, it's the biggest event. Uh, it takes place at, uh, in first week in May. It's uh, a major, major, major event in New York City um, for entertainment, for arts, mm. culture, right? It's Yeah, I, I would say it's the, maybe the, one of the biggest red carpets in the world. And yeah. Angela and Tony and I have been lucky enough to cover that every year. And it was one of the last things that they actually canceled. It was kind of, they were kind of like holding on to it, holding on to it, and then they finally canceled it. And that was a, that was a, you know, it's, I know it's only a red carpet, but it was a letdown for me. I really, uh, I really love doing that. Um, the social distancing circles and spacing out, you know, uh, started to happen a little bit when they started opening up the street. The Black Lives Matter protests were at the beginning, uh, just some of the most uh, heated exchanges between protesters and police like I've never seen before. And I, I've done a couple of protests over the last, you know, 20 years, and, you know, but, but these, these co uh, confrontations between protesters and police were angry, you know, like, and, and much different than I had ever seen. And if I have to get back to that thing where I had an event in my mind, that I just couldn't believe that I wasn't photographing it. On the night of one of the biggest protests, a night where Manhattan really, really took a beating, it was the night of Manhattan Hinge. I just couldn't get it out of my head. Like the, the, I had to do a protest and I couldn't do this like beauty photo that I always love to do. So I, I, for the first time in my life, I risked getting arrested trying to get into the middle of the street. This is 14th street. When, when a, a major like rioting was happening in New York city for the first time. I have lived in uh, Manhattan. Now. Uh, you know, a violent or uh, not violent, but uh, a more um, uh, angry protest with with fires lit on the street, with police cars being lit on fire, with with looting. It's always stuff I always thought I was seeing in Chicago, or I never thought I'd see it in, in Manhattan in these in these great neighborhoods. I I never thought that a protest like this with looting was possible in Manhattan, I, and I guess now I, anything is possible. Uh, so you know that uh, led to these boarded up storefronts on Fifth Avenue and Soho, these great high-end retailers, you know, just trying to avoid, I guess, uh, part of the looting that, that happened over the period of a couple of days until it got settled down. Um, let's get through some more of these. Johnny, that was pretty surreal to see New York, not only quiet, absent of people, but boarded up. It, it was as if the city was like really closed up. It really was not possible, not Fifth Avenue. You know, like I just, I always thought of it as a Brooklyn and Queens thing at the most. I never thought some of these neighborhoods would, would feel this kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, where protests would actually happen to this level in, in, 
uh, in these in these expensive neighborhoods, which was uh, it was just people had just had enough, and and it, Manhattan was no longer this untouchable uh, part of the five boroughs. Um, you know, the, re the reopening happened. I, I know I, we have uh, Oliver coming up next, but uh, when they started taking down some of these boards in Soho, it was actually some pretty nice art. If I had a bigger car, I would have taken <laughs> I would have taken one of these panels for myself. But uh, I, I saw them take down some uh, some some nice works of art. I'm I'm no expert, but it, it looked pretty. Uh, some of those things. When sports came back, the first thing we did was the Belmont Stakes. I went a couple of days earlier, actually a couple of weeks earlier, and I thought maybe this would be the right photo. I'll set up a remote here, show the empty seats, show this, the horses coming down, you know, for the final stretch. And after a day of going through the entire, you know, uh, nine races or whatever it was with empty seats, this place usually is 90,000 plus on, on race day. Uh, I set a remote behind um, uh, the line over here and, um, this to me became a more important photo. It, to me, it looked like the horses were even socially distancing for this uh, um, finish line photo. We also, for the first time in history, I made a photo of a champion uh, on one side and uh, a disinfecting uh, a worker on, on the left side. Uh, they, the fireworks for 4th of July went off from Macy's as planned, but they spread it out over four days and four or five different locations. Uh, so, you know, to avoid crowds, it was still something very nice to shoot, but you never really felt like you were in, uh, in full enjoyment of any of these things that we were doing. Baseball opened up along with all the other sports with no fans, a couple of dogs showed up, whatever. Uh, cardboard cutouts were a big deal. Um, Yankee Stadium with the limits uh, and, and, and City Field of how many, uh, you know, how many photographers you could have was was pretty strict, but you know we were fortunate enough to to be in that in that cut. I uh, covered a major championship in San Francisco, uh, and again, no fans, but you know they found their way to to view it somehow. You know, coming uh, from behind, uh, uh, cut out fence. Uh, they cut the tarp behind a fence there so they could view Phil Mickelson going to the tee box. Tiger Woods, I had access or I, I mean, I felt like I was the only photographer out there at, at some point. Um, uh, I was six holes with him on Sunday where he's wearing his traditional red. And I, I, I could swear that I was the only one out there for the first few holes. Um, uh, you know, just volunteers holding cell phones. I ran into the Jetsons on the flight home here, completely PPE'd out. Uh, more baseball, obsessed with the fact that it's not going to look like this ever again, I hope. So really, this was a rain delay, really just trying to capture the atmosphere of, of, a, of a sporting event without any fans. Long story on this one, but I'm just going to bypass it. It's, it's, it's uh, a walk-off uh, for the Mets while they're at Yankee Stadium. Uh, if you're a baseball fan, maybe that, that sounds strange to you, but it was strange. Um, again, more um, just the, the mascots. For both teams here yeah, this is the eagles and the mets they had uh, you know face masks this was a home opener for the eagles just a, a few weeks ago um things opening up like you know the statue of liberty and i saw uh, photographed the horrible funeral for uh, i guess a one-year-old who was caught in crossfire uh, uh during a protest not not happy days there food lines we had one of the hottest summers in New York. I, I guess that'll be lost in the mix, but boy, uh, I mean, even right now, it just doesn't even feel like fall. Uh, things were again starting to open up. This is a edge, it's a uh, observation deck. We had fashion week now in September, but a new type of fashion week where masks dominate, where social distancing, uh, social distancing dominates. Uh, and uh, it was just, you know, it's back to, it's, we're back to work, but it's certainly, anything but normal. And the one bright spot I could say, Jonathan, through this whole thing is that with the Holland Tunnel, I could go in and out of this town anytime I wanted. I could go from lower Man uh, from the East Village of Manhattan to uh, Liberty State Park in less than 10 minutes, it felt like. And I could do any sunset or sunrise that I wanted to. And, uh, you know, I, I really do love taking these types of photos. And thanks to Pat Bennett, our director of photography, he said, Johnny, just, you know, do it on quiet days, do whatever you want to do. And you know, we had some unbelievable weather in New York. We had storms, we had lightning, we had thunderclouds. We, you know, we had, um, for as far as that, some incredible uh, you know, weather events, uh, lightning being one of them. Uh, I think we had a 10 day period where 
uh, you know, bolts of lightning uh, around Manhattan uh, and the five boroughs were you know, really unbelievable to see uh, and, and makes me almost want to take up a new brand of photography, a, you know, a new love of, of, of chasing storms or and I would just like to say uh, thanks for having me, Jonathan. It's, it's, it's a great, great uh, privilege to be here. Those lightning photos, uh, it was at four, you, you had to set up a remote and like four in the morning, you said? Or... Oh, well, yeah, my daughter has a view of lower Manhattan. So one of them, I knew that there was going to be lightning. Uh, and I would, uh, I just kind of kicked her out of her room, <laughs> put her in. <laughs> I put her in the uh, the master bedroom with my wife, and I set up a remote outside the window, and I I, I pushed the bed on one side so I could hold on to the re, you know like the the, um, the shuttle release and look out the window while I was trying to get some sleep. And I think that one of those photos is like a five a.m. Like, Good I got for it. you. Thanks, All right, well, thanks, Johnny. Thank you. And uh, uh, finally, our final uh, panelist uh, of the day um is oliver Contreras. oliver is a freelance photographer and multimedia journalist based in washington dc he also works as a contract photo editor at the washington post during the last eight years as a photojournalist he's focused mainly on political news and stories of particular interest to the hispanic community he has also been recording the experiences of latino immigrants uh, in the u.s his projects have taken him to Central America, the U.S.-Mexican border, the Caribbean, and cities across the United States where he has uncovered immigrant sacrifice, determination, and dedication. For the past four years, he's been working um, mainly at the White House covering um, the President of the United States. Um, Oliver is originally from Chile, um, and he works um, for the Washington Post, shoots for the Washington Post, the New York Times, Bloomberg, SIPA, UPI, among others, and has collaborated with uh, National Geographic, Time Magazine, and other publications. He holds a MA in New Media and Photojournalism at George Washington University, the Corcoran School of Art and Design in Washington, and is also an avid musician and percussionist. And with that, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Oliver. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, I just have to say a thank you to the MLA for the opportunity. Uh, to Jonathan Wells for inviting me to be part, part of this panel. Uh, for me, it's a privilege uh, to be uh, sh showing my work uh, along these amazing photographers, Angela, Tony, and Johnny. I thought it was going to be easier to be the last person, but after seeing all these pictures, it's actually, you know, those lighting pictures too. <laughs> it's actually really hard, but I'll do my best. So I'm going to um, go ahead. So I just want to say, like, in, in my experience, like working as a, as a photographer, uh, this year has been one of the most challenges, uh, the challenging um, years of, of my entire career. And not just for, for COVID and like for the, all the news uh, coverage, but also because I'm, I'm a freelance. Uh, so it actually impacted me really, really, really hard uh, through a couple of months so that I couldn't work as normal. And so, but I just want to go ahead and I want to go back a little bit uh, from December in 2019. And we were just doing our normal job. This is uh, covering departures, covering arrivals, uh, press briefings, um, uh, state visits. Um, um, until the time the, the president, um, Donald Trump got impeached. Um, that was uh, the, the starting of the year. It was like uh, December 19, 18th. So we knew that the 2020 was gonna be crazy for all of us. In general, like we have the access to the White House. Uh, there are seven agencies that are part of this pool, the tide pool. They cover all the events at the White House and they're with the president the whole time. Um, but at the same time, there are some events. We have a lot of access with this president, to be honest. And um, so we are able to cover uh, a lot of things, uh, covering departures, arrivals, and pretty much like all the big events. And so the press is all over um, during the presidents uh, during Trump's impeachment, the White House, he was completely packed. We were 
just like people one on top of the other. Um, this is just an event that the Mandela office as well, like full of people, even though uh, Trump was impeached, uh, he could just continue doing his normal events. Uh, so for us, it was like even more intense because we were covering the events, but at the same time, we were with all the pressure of, of the impeachment. Um, this is a press conference for like during the Iranian um, uh, sanctions. Um, everything was normal. We started like hearing something like seeing some news about coronavirus, but nothing major. Uh, the press it was getting ready though, but uh, we just continue between, uh, we will continue with, uh, with impeachment. Um, until the time that Trump was uh, acquitted for all charges and we somehow saw the light and we thought it was gonna be a little better, <laughs> um, a little more quiet. Uh, and then we started just covering normal events and a lot of big things happened like the um, um, signing the, the trade deal with China. It was one of the biggest ones. Uh, uh, um, Oliver, just on the tri uh, China trade deal, how big was the Chinese delegation of press? I mean, it was like literally like a hundred Chinese journalists, right? Covered. This was now, was this March already? This uh, This is January 15th. Uh, January, yeah. Okay. And yeah, there was probably, we were two, 200 people in the back. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. like a normal big event at the White House. Sometimes right. like, we were 300 or more. Yeah depending on the room, um, the president just continued doing his normal events. Um, the coronavirus news, they were like a little harder um, on us, uh, but nothing happened in the White House. We, st we started getting ready for anything else, but um, the White House, it just continued with normal news. There was not much information about it at that time um, until we got the first press briefing room about coronavirus. And then we knew that it was real and it was coming. Um, so this is the press briefing room. Um, it was just packed. This is a normal day in the press briefing room. This is the first time actually the president went to the press briefing room. So that's why it's like super extra packed. Um, as you can see, you can see like journalists in the center, photographers on, on the sides, along with reporters from all over the world, video crews, all inside. Um, and then after that, we started getting, uh, having um, press briefings every single day with the president. Uh, the president just continued with his events, like multiple people. Um, we have to cover them all, of course. Um, so uh, we have more press briefings uh, about coronavirus this time, like the bigger ones. Um, this one it was actually this this day was the first day that we were allowed to go to the roof, and I was one of the first person to do that. And it was actually really cool, um, and also really beautiful with all the cherry blossoms. Um, there more announcements about coronavirus. Washington DC, this is March already. Uh, Washington DC was normal. People not wearing masks at all until uh, we started getting more news about um, all the dead, um, the deaths in, in the United States and people infected and, and inside of the White House, um, all members of the press as well. So there was, um, um, I'm sorry, um, the White House started putting more restrictions about COVID. And so we have to, they started limited the access to the press. So as you can see, all the people in the back, the three rows of people in the back is just press. And that was just it. And as well, you can see in the breath, uh, press briefing room, there was just a handful of people that they were allowed to cover and they have a space between them. And after that, there was just three spaces or two spaces between between them. Um, 
we still know we're in mass. This is probably April. Um, more press briefing rooms, task force, until we start seeing some uh, people wearing masks. It was like probably like June, we were kind of kind of late in the White House. I don't know why, but, um, but we just continue doing everything normal uh, with less people, but normal at this time for me it was really hard because i was just like i'm, I'm i was lucky that i have uh I'm, I'm working with the washington post as a photo editor so i have a couple of days that i work with them and i was also like through sipa uh working with at the white house or the washington post too i have a couple of days um, i have to fill in but all the rest of the time it was already gone so uh started getting super 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 hard for me and and and, sure. and uh, Oliver, um, uh, normally pre-COVID, with uh, the access you had, the hard pass, uh, which is a kind of all access pass, so to speak, to the White House, you could come and go into the press briefing room. That's the press office. Uh, you could go there every day if you wanted to. Um, if there was an event, not event, you with that pass, you pass through the security gates and you were free to go whenever you wanted. Once COVID and the Correspondents Association, they put in their own limits, right? And that you were actually mm -hmm. forbidden to go uh, unless you had a specific assignment or it was your pool day, so to speak. Is, is that right? That's correct. And right. still until now, I mean, we right. can't go to the White House if, we're, if we don't have an assignment or if right. we're not assigned to go. Right. Which is, uh, with the Harpers, is like pretty much the, the staff uh, right. credential. Um, so this is a little bit of... Um, um, Washington DC. Um, so during this time, I had I'll have more time in, in my hands. Um, I was I took advantage of like getting some rest, which was good after all the impeachment and all the events. Um, but I was able to do as, as well, like uh, like like Angela, uh, Johnny, and Tony. Like I had time to do some other things, uh, take pictures and on the street, like walk around, like do um sunsets and stuff like that it was really cool until like i decided to do a project like with, with this time it was a, a personal project about musicians i wanted to tell the stories about um because i, I know there were um i have a lot of friends who are musicians and they were not doing anything absolutely anything and they were not playing not teaching absolutely nothing so and all the news and every single photographer, they were covering hospital and they were covering. So I was like, I need to do something different as well to find a, a different perspective of COVID. And so I found this project and, and it helped me a lot to like keep myself uh, active and thinking about, uh, and, and I mean, keep practicing as well and keep shooting. And so the story was about musicians in Washington DC is, uh, full-time musicians um, and about th his, this guy is a producer as well. And, and it's just to tell the stories about how the impact of COVID on the pandemic on, on their, like, their job um, personally and, and professionally. Um, so hope, I mean, it was really good to, I did 12 uh, different portraits and I did this in front of the houses because at that time we couldn't like see, we couldn't, um, we have to keep social distance and everything. So I found that it was a good idea to do this. Um, fortunately, it was uh, recently published in the Washington Post. Um, um, we got uh, um, two pages, um, double track. And it was actually really, really good. I'm, I'm glad that that happened. Um, and then uh, it was like super late, like in the middle of the year. And when the White House started implementing more rules about COVID and they started like, cleaning more, like this is the amazing cleaning crew of the White House. These guys are just amazing. We spent a lot of time with them. Um, Oliver, maybe you could just explain briefly how small that room is. It's- This room is- How many permanent seats are there? Maybe five rows of five yeah like i think they're 30 something like 30 
six yes. six rows of six or something like that. Something like it's that. very very small. It's very small. It's just like uh, also the the place where we work normally, where all the desks are. There it's is even smaller. Small. Than that. Yeah, it's, it feels like you're in a submarine. Like you can't walk without like asking permission or like moving around because it's just too small. Um, it's the complete opposite of social distancing. So we were also like super scared about this because like, even though we were not too many people working at the White House, they will allow like around 35 people at that time working at the White House. And but we were still like with the risk of, of getting COVID because we were actually, we were too close. And so in June, this is the first time they started testing and checking uh, temperatures at the White House. This is the first day actually after so long, we like the press briefing just continue normally, no masks. As you can see, some of the reporters are wearing uh, masks. Um, and of course, like the president just continued with his normal schedule. This is the town hall in the Lincoln Memorial. Um, of course, like nobody wearing masks, no social distancing. Like right after this, uh, Hope Hicks is like right next to the president. Um, she was, um, uh, they, she announced that she was, she had COVID. Um, and some members of the staff too. As well, we have the flyovers here in Washington DC honoring the health workers, more social distancing at the White House. Uh, after that, the city started opening a little, like little by little. We started seeing a little signs of hope. Uh, churches uh, open until we have uh, um, the, death, the death of uh, George Floyd and also the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, I have to say, like I, well, at this time I was working more at the White House. I was covering more. Um, uh, more days at the White House. So I didn't have the opportunity to do much um, uh, protests. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I, like inside of me, I just wanted to do, I wanted to do it all, but I, I just have to focus on something and I I wanted to focus and continue with what I, what I was doing in, um, at the White House and covering the news and covering the president. Um, but I, I had the chance to cover like some peaceful marches um, and you see, of course, like empty national cathedral, um, more peaceful marches and protests. This is the first time I saw like, um, during the shutdown, I mean, during the, during the, the protest, um, uh, military inside of the Lincoln Memorial, uh, of course, the city just continued with their own normal events and this is like the, uh, the day that the Congressman Lewis uh, died. And of course we have to cover that and with multiple, like hundreds of people there. Um, 4th, of Ju 4th of July uh, was another event that just happened multiple people. So well, <laughs> like covering with like, with a N95 masks all the time. Um, sometimes with two masks, if you were inside um, of course, I, I was I, able to cover what Capitol Hill as well. Like I, I don't do it much, but uh, I was able to cover all the negotiations between the relief packages and and all the stress between the White House and and, and Congress. Um, so these portraits are really interesting because this is the first time I have I was able to do this kind of things, and I was using remote cameras, and because all the chairs were empty inside of the press briefing room. I was able to put remote cameras and just and and do like different things because we were all like tired of the same photos. Um, right after that, we came back from uh, all COVID and 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 we were like a little bit. This is the sense of what I had in the White House, but we were uh, we had the sense of uh COVID it was fine he was under control so the president it was focused more on, on the on the presidential campaign um, in the middle RBG 
die as well. We have to, I had the pleasure to, uh, to cover that. I was like, it was super emotional day uh, for everyone. Um, and then we went back to, to the presidential race. Uh, this is, uh, I was taking in, uh, in the motorcade. We were going to, we have to go with Trump uh, golf on, on weekends. So we have to motorcade a lot. More press briefings on coronavirus. And like, of course, in the middle of uh, this event, it was the, um, uh, when he delivered uh, his acceptance uh, speech for the Republican Party nomination. And the day after a press conference about COVID, that was the, um, it feels like a COVID party, but it's not. It's, the, it's another day in, 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 at the White House. We were super scared, trying to keep distance in the back and bring it the longest lens that we had. Uh, it was actually really hard. Um, back to Capitol Hill um, with the negotiations. Um, this is 9-11. Uh, um, yeah, this is 9-11 uh, anniversary in DC. Uh, we're almost done. We're back. This is another day that I would never forget <laughs> when the president uh, announced that he got COVID-19. We have to go with him to the Walter Reed and uh, First Lady as well. And, and then we started seeing everybody at the White House wearing masks. Um, this is me uh, when my nose, it was better because uh, there was some point that it was just, it was bleeding. Uh, I have, I, I spent a week and a half like with my nose bleeding, like putting band-aids and uh, this is some pictures from outside of the Walter Reed um, when Trump arrived to the White House. Uh, this is just another like, and and I've been like from that day I've been covering arrivals and departures from the president going to rallies. Um, this is from last night for Halloween, the Halloween party. Um, and yes, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you everyone for. Thanks Oliver. That's much. fantastic. That's great. So thanks everyone. So we just have a few minutes left. Um, we can take some uh, questions. If there's any, uh, any, any questions we have, we'd be um, happy to discuss them. Um, maybe uh, Oliver, what, um, what do you think is right now is the uh, the biggest challenge for you, uh, you know, just during this COVID time or? Uh, well, as a, as a freelancer, we always, like all the freelancers, we all, we've been thinking about what's going to happen. Uh, we'll, we've all been uh, thinking about if we're going to go back to the time where we were not working at all and uh, so we need to save money. We're all thinking about that or not. Um, so it's, it's, it's actually really, really stressful. It's really stressful. We, this is a job that we, we think and we feel as passion. I think, I don't want to speak for everyone, but for me, it's more passion than anything else. So I, I really want to do what we have to do in order to like deliver the news, um, yeah, no, I, I could feel as, you know, as we, as, 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 uh, you know, that we, we work together and we do assignments together and the same for Tony and, um, but, but I can feel the uh, added stress uh, these last few months, um, you know, in New York, in Washington, where I know everyone is, you know, a professional and I'm sure that goes the same for, for Angela and, and, and Johnny that you want to do your job, but there's so many unknowns now. And uh, as Johnny said, you know, you, you, you get up in the morning, you know, you sort of think you know what you're doing, or maybe you don't know what you're doing, but, but things change so quickly. You know, in the White House, we went from, I don't know, a, a quote unquote normal day to the president uh, being positive for COVID, right? And everything sort of in between. And uh, there's your own personal safety. Uh, there was the safety, uh, you know, during the protests and during the rallies. 
Um, as Angela said, you know, when things are burning and there's a lot of police around, it's, it's a, they're noisy, chaotic times. And then there's just your own personal safety of the virus, which you do your best to, um, uh, to protect yourself, but you just never quite know, right? And I think these are things that at the beginning of the year when we're having fun at the Super Bowl or at the Oscars or fashion show, it just nobody ever thought that we'd be kind of doing what we're doing today, right? Under these, um, under, under these circumstances. And then there's also just the business as Johnny may know, or, or you know, you had mentioned Oliver that, you know, even if you wanted to go to the White House, you couldn't go to the White House, right? <laughs> right? Like you were forbidden to go. And that's kind of hard when you were going a hundred miles an hour, right up until the impeachment. And then all of a sudden it, it stopped. Right? <laughs> Um, and, and I think I can sort of feel the stress a little bit uh, through, you know, um, through the photographers that, you know, certainly that I, I work with. I don't know how you guys feel, Johnny or Angela, you want to jump in? Or... We're just trying to protect everybody. I mean, ourselves, our families and everybody. I mean, you, <clears throat> I spoke once to a photojournalist who had covered war. I said, how do you feel about it? He goes, well, I, I nothing compared to what the the people that I photograph go through, I, I, I dismiss it. But here we are, you know, we go out there every day and we don't know if we got it. We don't know if we're going to catch it. We don't know. And it's just this perpetual worry. It's constantly, we don't want to get anybody sick. Oh, sure. And you have to go home to your families and yeah. uh, particularly Oliver, who was working in, you know, probably the most COVID friendly uh, <laughs> kind of uh, places where it's closed quarters tight quarters, closed, no uh, open uh, windows, or I don't think they have windows or doors open in the press room, uh, no. So that's difficult, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's uh, the added pressure, if there wasn't yeah. already pressure. And, and it, I, is, you know, it is still difficult right now, because uh, uh, I think they started wearing the staff, uh, the White House staff, they started wearing uh, masks right after a president got uh, COVID-19. But um, right now, it's pretty much the same. It's like everybody inside, they don't wear a mask and they wear a mask when they're outside of the complex because we are around. So it's, it's, really, it's, really, it's really hard. It, it creates, of course, like another layer of stress. Um, so we have to stay, like creating new habits and how to photograph. Well, I hope, um... Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for taking the time. I know everyone's busy, which is a good thing. Um, as photojournalists, we haven't been, although it's not the events that were nor I know Johnny was um, disappointed at the Met Gala and the Masters. Um, it's been quite a year for news and everything, uh, entertainment and lack of it became news and sports and lack of sports became news. And culture and um, uh, concerts and everything, uh, everything is, is became news and in this sort of 24 hour website, uh, mobile, uh, the, at the, um, the consumption of news has been like we've never seen before, right? And the good thing is, uh, at least for us in our business is that more people are consuming photos today than ever before. Um, so, um, I'd like to thank I could you. Jump in, John, yeah, really yeah, quick. yeah, please. Um, I feel a little, um, I, I feel worried and concerned about other colleagues, to be honest, like we were such a like big group of entertainment photographers or, you know, colleagues that I have little zoom happy hours with on Fridays from, from Getty and AP and other agencies. And it's just sad you know to see them not working and for them to not knowing where the next paycheck comes from especially the freelancers you know so yeah. and certainly in I talked to johnny about it hmm? and sports as well i'm sorry sports photographers as well absolutely yeah i heard sports is coming back slowly um i'm not sure i don't know too much about sports but yeah anything we shoot we should just be you know we're very fortunate in an unfortunate time yeah yes yeah yeah no and even sports i know they're coming back but as johnny had mentioned uh access is very limited now um i just know like in europe we're working with some photographers who are covering covering you know um 
uh, football, soccer there, and the access is very, very limited. I think same here, Johnny, right? Baseball games. It's um, Yeah, we're uh, upstairs, Jonathan. Um, and honestly, Canon, I mean, without Canon and uh, Canon Professional Services, I could never like cover it with the glass that we had. And, and they sent, they just sent anything that I needed to do this job from the new locations. They were, I mean, they are unbelievable. Right. Yeah. Because before I used to be on the third on the dugout, right. The third baseline, right. Or yeah. 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 Well, on the field. That's right. 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 Now you're, you're upstairs. Yeah. And it's sort of ironic because it's an empty stadium. So you figured you could spread people out a little bit, but I know it was even stricter. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, there, it wasn't like there wasn't photos to make. Uh, I, I felt, you know, the first three innings of a baseball game, I, I spent entirely trying to photograph, you know, COVID related, you know, like uh, photos and, and, and missing a lot of the action in the early innings because there were photos that I wanted to make uh, for the story that is, is 2020. That, right, you know, it's right. Not, uh, it's hopefully not right. again. Right. Well, I think we're going to end it uh, end it at that. I'd like to uh, thank everyone again uh, for participating. I wish you well and stay safe. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, the DLMA for hosting us and the participants uh, for listening and uh, and watching our photographers. Well, take care, everyone. <laughs>